delighted to see you here. We're also delighted to celebrate the life, the career, and the achievements of an American civil rights icon, attorney Fred Gray. We're also here to celebrate other achievements, which are the winners of our student and emerging filmmakers competition. But before I get there, I'd like to thank the principal sponsors of the March on Washington Film Festival, and they are the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Grain Management, the Ford Foundation, Tiffany Sanchez and Reginald Brown, and the Albertson Company. So thank you for all that you do. We'd also like to thank our friend and colleague, Marquette Shepard of the Rabin Group, who helped produce this event tonight. Thank you, Marquette. Um, the Emerging and Student Filmmakers Competition debuted in the year 2016, and it gives filmmakers an opportunity to use their voice in the cinematic arts to advance civil rights and to tell their stories. That's also a principal goal of the March on Washington Film Festival. Uh, this competition received almost 100 entries this year from across the United States and really from around the world. And by the way, people from around the world are streaming this tonight. So we've got quite a large audience um, everywhere. I'd like to thank the judges of the competition for their service. And they are Mohamed Safari, Dr. Nicholas Bukola, Jacques Telemach, all of whom judge the student competition, and the judges for the emerging jury, who are Charles Belk, Alison Sotomayor, and Monica Wise. Thank you all for what you've done for the festival and for the emerging filmmakers this year. And now it's my great pleasure to announce the winners of this year's competition. We'll announce first the uh, special mentions and then the uh, grand prize winners in each category. So, for the student competition documentary section, special mention goes to It Takes a Circus by Sarah D. Collins and Zoe Chisere Ramushu. And the grand prize in the category goes to Unfinished Lives by Yukong Chen. For the student competition narrative, special mention goes to Midnight in the Valley by C. Craig. And the grand prize goes to Contusion by Amin Anari. For the emerging competition documentary, a special mention goes to Midnight Oil by Bilal Motley. And the grand prize goes to Since You Arrived, My Heart Stopped Belonging to Me by Aaron Samine Kokil. And finally, for the emerging competition narrative, special mention goes to R.E.S.T by John Appel, and the grand prize goes to Black Thoughts by Dwayne Logan. Uh, our moderator for tonight is Mr. Jamal Simmons, who has spent over two decades at the nexus of politics, media, and technology. Um, he is a former principal of the Rabin Group, where he provided communications and strategic counsel for a wide array of clients. These days, you can see him on CNN, on NPR, or listen to NPR, uh, where he serves as a political analyst and commentator. Uh, he is a fiction writer, a cultural DC board member, a husband, and a father of two. And we're very proud to welcome Mr. Jamal Simmons. Thank you for thank you for having me. All right, they got the they got the furniture out now, so we can go ahead and get started. I thought I was going to have to vamp here for a minute. Um, so uh, I'm excited to be here. This is a uh, I've seen this film festival grow from something that was just an idea in Robert Rabin's head uh, to something that now is being witnessed by people all over the world. And so I'm very honored to be a part of this particular night, but especially because we are in the middle of what is now a real moment of activism 
uh, in the country and, and really in the world, but in the country. I mean, we saw it today even as our rights are still under assault in Texas and other places. So um, I want to have a conversation tonight and really a conversation with the people who are going to come up here on this stage, Ms. Colvin, um, former Senator Jones, uh, we'll have Taylor Branch, and obviously uh, we'll going to talk to Fred Gray. But I want to have a conversation tonight not just about kind of the mythical heroes of our past, right? We can get too lost in sort of the mythology of our past. I want to have a conversation about what's really happening, what really happened then when human beings had to sit down around a table or sit down in a living room and decide things to do to try to move the ball forward for freedom and justice and equality so that those of us who are in this moment who are making the same kinds of choices feel like we can make those choices with the same kind of confidence. So with that said, uh, if I could uh, get, invite Ms. Colvin to come on up. We're going to do this first conversation from the floor. Uh, yeah, let's turn it around to the, to the people. Let the people look at you. <laughs> Okay. All right. <laughs> You're looking good, too. Let them look at you. You know, so, yeah. Claudette Colvin, everybody. <laughs> for those of you who uh, haven't read the notes uh, for today's assignment, <laughs> for today's class, um, Claudette Colvin was born in 1939. She's a pioneer of the 1950s civil rights movement and a retired nurse aide. Uh, on March 2nd, 1955, she was arrested at the age of 15 in Montgomery, Alabama, for refusing to give up her seat while a white woman on a crowded, to a white woman on, on a crowded bus, in a segregated bus in Montgomery. This occurred nine months before the more widely known incident in which Rosa Parks, uh, the secretary of the local chapter of the NAACP, did the same thing, and the 1955 Montgomery bus boycott came right after. I want to have a conversation with you, Ms. Colvin, because um, I think you got a lot to say. I don't want to hear about all of it. Um, you were 15 years old, 15 years old, when you were sitting on that bus. And I heard you tell a story that is, may not mean a lot to a lot of people, but it means a lot, I think, for those of us now who are looking back. You talked about Negro History Week being taught at your school. You talked about your own um, feelings of, of pride and examination in history. And you said that you had braids in your hair. You were braids in your hair at that moment. At a time, my grandmother is from Alabama. I understand the culture of the South. For a black woman in the South in the 50s to wear braids was a statement about pride that was not very common. So in that moment at 15, tell me, put us in, in your eyes and your shoes when you were sitting on that bus. Oh, uh, when I was sitting on the bus? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was sitting, you know, we start off, I said, once upon a time in Montgomery, Alabama, <laughs> everything was se uh, segregated, and they had signs to remind you, both for white and black, to keep us separated. You know, they are, at the time, that we were called Negroes of Color. The, the sign was said color and white, you know. And that's when you had to go to the, the, for the Negroes, you had to go to the back of the bus, sit in the back of the bus. But I said, um, I, I had talked, as he said before, that uh, it was Negro History Week, but uh, the faculty members of Booker T. Washington High School decided that since, uh, uh, okay, we, Negroes were left out of uh, American history, that we should have it for the whole month. And instead of just singing Negro spirituals, and reciting poems, and uh, my teacher, Mrs. Ger well, it was two teachers, Mrs. Geraldine Nesby 
and Mrs. Joseph Lawrence. Mrs. Joseph Lawrence at that time was my social study teacher. It was like they teach civics, social study teacher, and uh, Mrs. Nesbitt was my English teacher, but she refused to teach uh, she, English. She uh, said that uh, she, if she was going to teach grammar, you know, conjugating verbs and things, she, need, she needed us at two years old. So, <laughs> so she refused to just teach grammar. She, to, she taught us how to write essays, and she... That's what happened in uh, well, what was happening to me in Montgomery. My mind, I'll tell you this long story, because my mind had, was, all of this was in the back of my mind when I was asked to move to the rear of the bus. So it was uh, four of us, you know. Just for instance, uh, I'll make a demonstration, just like here, and these two ladies here, but like, I was sitting uh, near the, uh, the went, like right in that empty seat, in that empty seat here, would be another lady. Uh, uh, this lady would be in the, next to me, and that's the window of the bus, right? Okay. And I was in there, and of the, uh, I sitting in this seat. I refused to move, but this lady here and these two lady here, they were. My, I'm just demonstrating with the student. They got up reluctantly and moved to, oh, they just took their time and moved to the, and stood up. But, uh, so when it happened, the reason why, you know, another thing I wanted to point out, the reason why the students didn't get up and run off the bus and leave me sitting on the bus, we all, I said, they picked the wrong time to pick on us because we all were full of Negro history. <laughs> and we all were very proud. So that's why they didn't move. They was, a, they was afraid to move. But the main reason I talked to a, a, one of the ladies, her name is, she still, we still chat on the telephone, Margaret Johnson. She mm -hmm. was sitting in the rear, uh, she was sitting behind, uh, 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 in the bus too. She was on the bus. I don't know what seat she was in, but it was there. So when this white lady, no, there was a white girl really, she said, oh, no, she got to get up because that's the law. And Margaret Johnson shouted out, she don't have to do nothing but stay black and die. That's what she said. <laughs> So that you know that's, and I, that that gave me more. I was more. I said that gave me more courage, and that gave me more power to to remain seated in that on in that seat and not get up, because the white lady that was standing uh, near us, she could have sit in that empty seat opposite me, but she wasn't seated in that seat opposite me because white people wasn't supposed to sit opposite you. They were supposed to sit in front. The signs fixed it. So they would sit in front of you, and you sit behind them. You wasn't supposed to have eye contact with these white people. That was just to show that they were superior and you inferior. So, but it didn't register on me that day. I remained seated. <laughs> so you weren't having it that day? Yes. <laughs> you weren't having it. So the police show up, right? And yeah. uh, you're sitting there, 15 years old, and here come these white cops. What's going through your mind? Oh, going through my mind with that, uh, that uh, essay and that uh, reading and all the... Uh, what Ms. Nesbitt had taught me, everything was, uh, what she had lectured to us about. That, that was the mind that we were supposed to be, uh, reflect on our heroes, and she, you know, the people say she rose, but I would just say, all our heroes were left out of American history books, mm -hmm. and I was full of it. So when the police come on the bus, and you know, they looked at me, and they had said, and they knock my books on the floor and they say, Gail, why are you sitting in there? I say, it's my constitution. I pay my fare, and it's my constitutional rights. <laughs> <laughs> and 
They said constitutional rights, and I don't know whatever happened. One hand, one got one, one got a, they manhandled, because I, I didn't do that, uh, uh, Mrs. Park, the gentle lady, get up and move. I remained seated. I said, I tell the reporter, history had me glued to the seat I couldn't move. Who was on your shoulders? And guess why the history had me glued to the seat? Because that spirit of Sojourner Drew Hall was pushing me down on one shoulder and Harriet Tubman was pushing me down on the other shoulder. <laughs> and that was me to that. Girl, don't get up. Don't move. So they, are they manhandling me? I don't know how I got into the... I really, to this day, I can't tell you how I got in that police car. But then I, they, they sit me in the police car because I wasn't moving. They just took me up. I, I weighed about 106 pounds. <laughs> so they just took me up and just slammed me in the car. And then when they found out that I, I don't know who told them to handcuff me, that someone told me to handcuff me. I don't know who told them to handcuff me. So I stood, they, uh, they told me to stick my hands out the window, and I stuck my hand out the window that day, and they handcuffed me. Was there a crowd? Did, had people, did people assemble around this scene? Oh, or, yeah, or well, what? anyway, I told you this a long story. Didn't I tell you a long story? <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate you giving out the shortcuts. <laughs> but, uh, but what happened was that the first one police come on was a uh, Tra uh, traffic patrol, but you know, on the little motor scooters that checked the people who were, at that time you had to pay the, you know, the meters. Well, I don't know y'all, you, nobody old enough than me, but they, they, you had to pay the meter where you park, right? Yeah. And they then they they were going around seeing it. That's how they throw little traffic, and they call him, and he he come in the back of the bus, and they, and uh, they, they said, that she is that gal. And, and, and that's when I, uh, the first time I said it was my constitutional right. But uh, that traffic said, patrol said, I, I don't have no jurisdiction here. This is not my jurisdiction. We was at the little mini, D uh, that's down in Montgomery. It's not there, but you, I know it was, if you go to Montgomery, it's called Court Square. And there it was a fountain opposite that stopped. You just, this, this is the street. There's a fountain though, where they are, you know, it was street and out. And then over here, like on this side, is a little mini depot, and you know, the color on one side and the white is on, on another side. And you sit, you stand there, because that's where all, all in, you know, Montgomery is a small town, where all the buses come, come around the court square, and that's where you change to go into the direction that you want to go into. You get on your bus there. So it was about, when we got to Fort Square, it was about 10 or 4, more than 10, more than a dozen of black people standing there waiting in the boat to bus, and on the other side, white people. So the bus, the bus, they, uh, when the police, the bus driver, the police would come on, they must have told you, we are not going to arrest her here. I would say they're traffic police, not the real, not the squad car. We, you can't, uh, uh, don't arrest bother here, here. We, the bus drivers, pulled off and went one block to Bibb and Conway Street and stopped. So we thought it was all over with. We said, well, oh, well they, that was, because the bus, the bus went in the same route, route that, we go, that you normally take to get to my, uh, to go to my section of, in the community. That was the same bus route, and we thought it was all over with. And guess what? So he you know, had called the, the, the uh, tra traffic patrolman, had, but that is the old, they didn't have the modern equipment now. So it, had, it wasn't a bus driver, because a bus driver didn't have that kind of equipment. Mm -hmm. It had to be the traffic patrolman called a squad car. Yeah. And two policemen, two policemen come on. One of them was a little short, stout one, came on the, on, the, on the bus, and that's when they come on the bus. And they uh, arrested me at Bibb and Karma Street. And I said, well, they got away. They, they was clever. Because on Bibb and Karma Street, there was nobody standing there, you okay. know. 
So that's where I was arrested on Bibb and Conway Street. So, so can you take us a little bit forward to when you first meet Mr. Gray and you have a case? You've been charged with violating segregation law, assault, disorderly conduct. And now you've got a lawyer and you've got to go to court. Uh, that seems like that was a lot <laughs> for, oh, for a young Oh, I tell lady. you, I said, I would tell everybody when they, I was telling mom and I was telling you know, some other people. I said, when I tell the story, I said, it sound like, a, sound like a, something in Shakespeare. Sound like some of Shakespeare. But Ms. Nesby had been teaching us. So yeah. I, I said, you know where you have conflict? <laughs> and then you have triumph. Yeah. And I said, oh, I said, this is one of those stories, you know. I said, uh, it was, what, uh, I was glad to meet Attorney Fred Gray. I said, oh, this is nice. an adult person with all that knowledge. And he was a very, mama said, oh, that man is very smart. I said, no, mama, he's not smart. He is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, he took my case and got, you know, he did all the legal stuff that, mm -hmm. that you have to do because I was a minor. Yeah. So the QP Carvin. See, the thing about it is that, uh, I don't know, when Negro History Month was coming up, I don't know what happened was I had been wearing my hair and braiding. I said, why do we have to struggle with that hot combo? So when I was coming, well, anyway, I, I don't want to tell you that. This is, this is a joke. Y'all gonna laugh about it. <laughs> Do you know they used to take take your hair and just with that hot comb? Yeah. And try to straighten it and pull it through like that? Yeah. To get those to get the uh, little uh, curly the little mm -hmm. sprinkles out. Yeah. I was punch I would be running from that comb. <laughs> and so anyway, I, they knew that I was, you know, was was on trying, they didn't, at that time, they didn't say, trying to find my identity. Who am I? Am I a Negro or am I colored? You know what I mean? And Miss Miss Neighbor was telling that we come from, we was kidnapped and put in slavery in America. And then you know, I said, when you tell me these Christian white people did all of that? <laughs> so anyway, that's what was happening. I had I already had the braids. You know how the magic braids were? Three across rows across the top and four in the back. Four, four little, you know, flats in the back. So it, it wasn't like the braids now. It was the big, you know, the big piece yeah. of hair. And you divide it into four little braids in the back and three across the top. And anyway, I said, well, and then I used to take the tongue. I said, oh, no, you ain't getting to the edge of my hair. I let this stay kinky. So, so the kids today would have called you woke. <laughs> <laughs> oh. With your black history and your, you know, your braids and you know, yes. all that. They would have called you woke. So here you are. Uh, it's decades later. And your story did not end up being the story that launched the, 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 the moment of, of community outrage. But some people have argued that without your story, um, we would not have gotten the commitment from the community that came at uh, the end of the year when Ms. Parks uh, had her moment. So you're looking back at this now. How do you feel having lived a life where you were a part of this beginning of really a revolution that changed the condition of black people in America? Uh, how did I feel? How do you feel now? How do I feel now? Well, well anyway, thank is, is my mother said, you know, I think it's Psalm 90, verse 10, that they, how they tell you God give you three scores and ten. I, I make the three scores and ten, and if, oh, I guess the reason to speak more, you, you get eight and you get ten more years. Mm -hmm. So it's in the, uh, so I uh, got my three scores and ten, and I got to eighty. So I'm glad to be here to tell my story about the ugly side of America. Mm -hmm. It's a good side and it's an ugly side. America is just like what the name of that movie that the man made. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes. So that's how. All right. 
Right now, I'm glad that I did what I did. And it, it was the people, instead of the, uh, being the old people inspiring the young people, because how many times I heard my mother's friend, you know, older adult people talk about what they're going to do to the, what they should have did. They should have did this and they did that. And then one would say, oh, yes, I cussed out, right? That's and I cussed out and I got off the bus. And then one would say, I, they, I just told her, I don't want that. If she can't give me my whole salary, I don't want no just one day at a time, one day at a time when you get the money. You don't think that I'm good about working value. I'm still in slavery. You're going to take your time to pay me. They complain, I'm telling you, there were so many grievances of the adult, but they didn't get out and, uh, you know, when they had a chance and protest. So when, it, when, it, when my time come, I don't, to this day, I don't know the people, the old people say, the older people and the religious Christian people say, it was God guiding you. It was Jesus that was guiding you. You know what I'm saying? And he was the one that was protecting you. And so I said, well, it may be Jesus and he sent some angels to give me the courage to stay seated. And that little courage for me, since the older people wanted to do it, they was talking to and they had all these grievances to say that uh, but they wouldn't take them to the people and tell them that they was hurting and that they was treated unfairly under the system. Jim Crow system in the South, they were treated so unfairly, but they didn't get out. But I'm saying, it's a young person that inspired the older people. Yes, come on, girl. I'm glad you did what you did. <laughs> Amen. All right, Claudette Colvin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, we are going to uh, reset and bring up our, uh, our next panel of conversation. If I could get those folks to come on up, Mr. Branch, and where is Senator Jones? You can. That was, a, that was a good way to get started because um, we got some real live, firsthand conversation uh, look at what was, what was happening on the ground at this seminal moment. And uh, I think that's a, good, that's a good place for us to, to start this conversation where now we can give some, we have some perspective and we can talk about what it looks like now decades removed from what it is that happened. So I'm going to start off with um, Taylor Branch. I guess I should do some introductions here so folks know who's, who we're talking to. Um, get, my, get my act together, Mr. Moderator. Um, Doug Jones was a United States Senator from Alabama from 2018 to 2021. He was the United States Attorney for the North District of Alabama from 1997 to 2001. And when he was, 1997, he was appointed by President Bill Clinton as U.S. Attorney from the Northern District. Mr. Jones' most prominent case was the successful, two, the successful prosecution of two Ku Klux Klan members for the 1963 Birmingham church bombing that killed four African-American girls and the indictment of domestic terrorist Eric Rudolph. Taylor Branch. Taylor Branch is an American author and historian best known for his trilogy of books chronicling the life of Martin Luther King Jr. and much of the history of the American civil rights movement the first book, Parting the Waters, America and the King Years, won the Pulitzer Prize and numerous awards in 1989. And I would just say, you know, I got, I got mine here, right here. Um, uh, if you have not read these books, uh, it is worth the time and effort to do it. So, 
Mr. Branch, let's start with you. Can we talk about the women? <laughs> uh, a lot of times when we have these conversations about the civil rights movement, um, we know the names of King and Abernathy and Lewis and Julian Bond, and we talk, you know, Stokely, we talk about the men who led these movements, uh, who were out in front and on television. But there were these women like Claudette Colvin who had such uh, courage and bravery. Um, what role did you see in the research you did uh, about the role of women in the civil rights movement that may not be as well known as the names we just mentioned? Well, I, I think it's fair. To, first of all, it was wonderful to hear Ms. Colvin talk about this and, and talk about con confronting these uh, big policemen because it did remind me that in doing the research, it was pretty obvious a few years into it, I spent 24 years doing it, that the movement was run by women as long as there wasn't a microphone. Um, <laughs> whenever there was a microphone, the men would materialize, and they seemed to have control uh, of that. And that's true right from the bus boycott. I mean, there were three women, Ms. Ms. Colvin, uh, another lady named Smith, and then Rosa Parks. It was Mary Louise Smith. The, 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 the community was trying to find a case to rally around to protest segregation, and all of the test cases involved women. And then the following February, when Mr. Gray filed the lawsuit, and that was a big controversy. There are all kinds of fights in here. Why should we, bus boy, why should we boycott if we're going to file a lawsuit? Um, but they finally worked up the courage to challenge the constitutionality of uh, segregated buses uh, head on and they needed plaintiffs and if I'm not mistaken Mr. Gray all the plaintiffs were women uh, they couldn't find any male plaintiffs so and that's in fact how Mr. Gray got indicted for a crime I had never heard of called baratry yeah. uh, which is the false representation of a client because as soon as he filed a suit uh, uh, pressure came down on his clients some of whom lost their nerve and said, I didn't file that lawsuit. And so then they indicted uh, uh, Mr. Gray for falsely representing. You know, they had the power of intimidation. But the people they were intimidating were women. The bottom line on this, Jamal, is that our historical race relations um, throughout American history have been grounded in violence. Slavery was grounded in violence. There was no consent in slavery. It was a rule of violence. And that, that's been true in, in race relations. And the violence was mostly against the men. There was, there was some qualms about violence against black women. Not complete qualms, because there was a lot of violence and oppression of black women. But the military notion was more about the men, and it opened up an opportunity for women to be leaders in the movement, and, and they took it. I mean, um, Diane Nash told me that uh, when she started in the nonviolent classes, it was four years after Mr. Gray filed that suit on February 1st, 1956, you had the sit-ins starting. And they had been doing nonviolent um, uh, workshops uh, before the sit-ins started. And Diane Nash said that it was an army where females could be privates, sergeants, and generals in a nonviolent army. Uh, they'd be excluded from a traditional Napoleonic army. So the movement opened up opportunities for women's courage, and uh, you see it all the way through. Um, well, when we talk about courage, I think we've got to have a conversation about you, Senator Jones. Um, as I talk to folks who are in Alabama, and, they, and your name comes up, they talk about the courage that you had to take on the Ku Klux Klan as a white man in Alabama. Um, at that moment. And uh, talk to us a little bit about how, when you're making those decisions, the history of where you are and any impact that may have had on the choices you made in your legal career. Well, first of all, I appreciate it. And second of all, I, I, I am no hero. I, didn't know, I, I don't think it takes courage to do the right thing. And that was a job, and it was, an un, it was, a, it was a case that had been an open wound in Alabama. Uh, in Birmingham in particular for a long time, and I got an opportunity at just the right time as United States Attorney uh, to take that case to the next level and see. But now, we knew going in uh, that that was not going to be an easy case. 
you know, by the time I was sworn in in 1997, the investigation had gone about a year. Uh, and, you know, that, which meant the case was over 30 years old, getting on 35, I think, something along those lines. You know, when witnesses were dying, witnesses were already dead, uh, witnesses' memories were fading. But at the end of the day, uh, we had a really incredible team that looked at this case from this standpoint. And that is, is it the right thing to do once we get uh, enough evidence? And we knew that there was a burden of history to the case. You could not get around the burden of history that we all felt. However, we had to put that aside a little bit. We had to kind of move that into the role of looking at the case strictly from a prosecutor's eyes. Can you make this case? Can you prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt? And we got a, we got a hell of a lot of lucky breaks. We, everything just seemed to fall into place for us to where we were able to make sure that we got witnesses, we pulled together evidence, and a lot of it was not new evidence. People ask me a lot about what new evidence that we had. Well, we didn't have an awful lot of new evidence. We did have some confessions of, uh, or admissions, so to speak, from Bobby Frank Cherry, but a lot of the evidence was just repackaged in a different way because it was not, the evidence was still there, and it was not the evidence that changed as much as it was the jury and the community and the people. We, we knew that if we could get the case to trial and there was, evidence was there, that unlike what could have happened or would have happened in the late 1960s, um, we would have had a fair jury. And we were convinced of that. So there was a lot that went into it. The burden of history was all, always there with us. But at the same time, um, it, is, it was one that we were never going to shirk we were going to look at it in the, under the law and the facts, and we were very, very fortunate. Um, too often, I started out talking about this, too often when we look backwards, uh, Taylor, too often when we look backwards, we have a, a, a hazy gauze <laughs> over the event. Uh, and it does seem like um, things were foreordained to work out. Uh, but that's not, that's not what... It, I bet the people who were involved felt like when they were making some of these decisions. And you talked a little bit about um, people unpacking and sitting around and some of the arguments that took place. What were the, what were the big fault lines that you saw uh, when you did your research in this community in the 1950s that led to, you know, now we think of this, you know, Martin Luther King as this huge uh, figure. He was not a huge figure in 1955. Well, there were many fault lines, and uh, that's one reason that the history has been hard to uh, be captured. I've spent 35 years trying to make films based on my book, and I'm uh, with some of the best directors in Hollywood, and they all love the idea of civil rights in the abstract, but when you get down to showing the arguments and the fights that were going on, the divisions about what to do. It's not, it's not just, I'll be wholesome and go forward. It's, I gotta argue with every. One of the things that was most striking about Dr. King is that he surrounded himself with incredibly headstrong people, many of whom did not like each other. Jim Bevel and Hosea Williams did not like each other. Jesse Jackson, all these people, they were at one another's throats about what to do. What, what sacrifice would pay off and what was showing off. Um, uh, the, the difference between a biblical approach, a legal approach, sacrifice, uh, ultimately nonviolence. So th the movement is about, is about respecting people enough to try to figure out what can move us forward. And they kept saying, Dr. King kept saying, I want you to find me the deep wells. The only thing we have hope, the only thing we have going for us is that Americans profess to believe in democracy in the deep wells. What does, how can we pull them up so that they can they have to stare at it right square and say, we either believe in democracy um, and, and, and we are better, or we don't believe in democracy and we'd rather be white. Um, and that's what was going on in the movement. So there were tremendous... Um, one other thing that Dr. King said was, a lot of white people think that because most black people are poor at the time, they didn't have cars during the bus boycott, 
that they may not have any class distinctions. They may not have divisions within the community. He says that's ridiculous. When you've got a scarce value like prestige and there's not much of it, you carve it up into all kind of little small things. And the difference between Dexter Avenue Baptist Church and First Baptist Church where Ralph Abernathy was, was a, those were fighting words. Some, some, some people thought one was respectable and one wasn't. So there were a lot of divisions within the community about who, who should drive? Who should provide transportation? Who's going to allow somebody to get dirty feet into their car during the... So there were tremendous... Um, that's one of the really significant things about Rosa Parks. She, she was a very um, educated woman, but she was a humble woman. Her, you know, her husband, she was a seamstress and her husband was a barber. And she was respected by a broad cross-section of, uh, of the population and, and was known so that when the community that had been looking for a case to take uh, in that year when she came along, she helped overcome a lot of those divisions, but the divisions were still there. That's what it, it takes to have a movement is, is to pull people together to discover a common sense that they didn't have before. And uh, that's why the bus boycott became historical. Um, I'm going to read something from your book because this line, this, this little nugget, I think rings. Um, this is when Claudette Colvin, when Ms. Colvin was arrested, when she, when she refused to get up and the, and the, the melee broke out on the bus. <clears throat> One white woman defended her to, to the police, saying that Colvin was allowed to sit in no man's land as long as there were no seats in the Negro section. And so you get the geography, you had white section, Negro section, and there was a section in the middle that was supposed to be a buffer, which black people could move into if there was nobody else sitting there. Um, but if white people wanted to, you were supposed to move out. So this white woman defended her to the police, saying that Colvin was allowed to sit in no man's land as long as there were no seats in the Negro section. But another white woman said that if Colvin were allowed to defy the police, quote, they will take over. And it seems to me <laughs> in 2021 that that sentiment that they will take over is a lot of what's driving the politics and the, the vitriol of this moment, is this fear that they, being people who look more like me than look like you, um, will take over and quote, as they said in Charlottesville, they will replace us. Um, so, uh, Senator, you've, you've navigated politics in the South. You've, you've seen this up close. Is, your, is, is that your sensibility, that this, that this sentiment is real? Yeah, no, it is very, it's, it's very real, and it's really unfortunate. But certainly, uh, yeah, I, I, I navigated, but I also crashed and burned there for a little bit, too, because <laughs> it is so difficult uh, to navigate. Um, and I don't think people fully comprehend. This is not today, in my view, politically. This is not just about race. This is about hate. And hate is a component of, of all the racial issues, for sure. And race is, and hate is a component of the racial issues. But hate is really driving so much of what we're seeing now. Because it, 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 people have gone from holding someone who doesn't believe like they do in contempt to, hold, to just hating them and going out. And, and once you get that moment, I told some folks yesterday we had a program here with the National Association of Attorneys General about the church bombing cases. And, and it was, the conference was on hate. And I said, you know, hate is truly one of the fiercest motivators for violence these days. It, and uh, what we saw on January 6th, what we've seen throughout this country, is a fear that has motivated by hate. And it's very difficult because it is now permeating through folks who would, in my view, would never ever resort to any kind of violence, but because they have been stoked uh, and, and out of fear that they're losing something. Uh, that is a, it, it's a real problem. We see it time and time again. And we've got to have people, both sides of the political aisle, all races, all religions, kind of step up and say, hold on just a minute. We are, we are all in this together. We're living in, the, in this together. This is the, still the greatest country in the world, that the uh, greatest country the world's ever seen. But the fact is, if we don't start caring for each other a little bit more and respecting each other a lot more, we're going to be in real trouble. There's no question, Jamal. We're going to be, I, I think, in real trouble. And we've got to make sure 
Uh, we need more people. We need, we need more Claudette Colvins. We need more Fred Grays. We need more folks to stand up and speak out to cause what our friend John Lewis said a little good trouble. So, uh, yes. I would also argue that we need more Doug Joneses. <laughs> well, <laughs> I would yeah. argue that we need more <laughs> Taylor Branches, right? Um, and Mr. Branch, I want to get you in on this because um, as you look back and you look and you read the news now and you hear these stories, do they ring familiar to you from what your research from the time in the 50s that you hear this, um, this vitriol? Because it seems to me that the, some of the people who resisted Fred, Fred Gray and his, and his contemporaries are still with us, or their children are with us, but certainly their ideas and their view on how America should be governed is still with us. I, I think that the, the, the hatred and the division, the separation, I mean, I live in Baltimore, and I know a lot of people who are scared to go downtown, mm -hmm. um, who are otherwise decent people. The, the division uh, is, is really strong, and I, I think one thing that is different now from then that's also related to race is that in those days, while there, were, there was segregation, there was violence, there was the Klan, there was overt racism everywhere, there was an optimism, of, optimism about the government. We had just won World War II, we had just licked polio, we were going to go to the moon, we were confident in our institutions. And I think what's happened in the last years since then is that we've slowly um, gotten cynical about our government, in part because the government stood up for good race relations, so people started resenting the government. And now they've been resenting it so long, they're trapped in it. They, they're trapped in a cynicism about the government that feeds the hate. And I've been conscious of people that don't even think they're... they're they have any thought about race relations, but they're so trapped in cynicism about a, a positive pu public purpose that they that they wind up supporting um, an anti-race, you know, a, a racist agenda. So I think we're dealing with two problems: we're dealing with race, and we're dealing with cynicism about government. And if we don't solve both of them, we we need to solve them together. Because if people don't believe that we can work together constructively, then uh, it's going to be hard to fight racism. Great. Um, so, Senator Jones, uh, so there's the government and public policy. There's also private sector work. You're a lawyer longer than you were in government and, right. private, and private life. What is the role of, um, of the private sector in tackling some of, these, some of these challenges? And as you navigated it through Alabama, the role of how people, um, maybe how, how the legal profession dealt with someone like Fred Gray uh, and his work? Well, first of all, in, in the private sector these days, I, 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 I have said, and I've said for a long time, but I'm, I think it's especially important now. Uh, after George Floyd's death, it seemed that we were moving into an era where uh, big companies, corporations, the public, the private sector in America was having that moment where we were saying, we've got to do more. We've got to speak out. And we saw that briefly. And then all of a sudden, you know, whether it was Fox News or whether it was a, a, a rabid shareholders, they started pulling back and getting a little bit more timid. We saw it in Alabama when we had such a horrible immigration bill some 10 years ago or so. The, the business community stepped out and they said, we oppose this, but they just didn't do it strong enough. They didn't put their money where their mouth was. And in, in, uh, that's where I think that our, public, our private sector has such an important role. They employ people. They have shareholders. They have voices. They have power. And if they would start insisting that government officials, that public officials, that candidates acknowledge the problems that we're in and start to work to have solutions, we could make some significant differences, I think, in this country. And, and we see it, but then we see this pullback when there's the least little bit of resistance. You know, and as far as the legal community is concerned about Fred Gray, I will tell you as an Alabama lawyer, Fred is revered in Alabama. It may have taken a long time for him to get that. But I think as now, as young lawyers, black and white, it doesn't matter. 
they look back over a career of, of Fred Gray and they see a lawyer who was there on the streets. And that's so important because we hear, everybody hears about Thurgood Marshall and, and you know, uh, Constance Baker Motley and all of those folks. But it was the lawyers like Fred who was there in the jail with Claudette Coleman, who was there at the jail with Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King and had the foresight and the intelligence to think ahead. Uh, the, the, the one man, one vote, the Gamillion case, those kind of things. That, th those are the kind of stories that I think more and more inspire young lawyers because it shows that law can be for good. It can do good things if you've got the right mind, the right heart, the right way to pursue it and, and the patience to get it done. And so I, I, I was so happy uh, a few years ago when the uh, Alabama Bar Association, uh, essentially by acclamation, uh, voted Fred as the first African-American uh, president of the Alabama Bar Association. It was a very significant step. It took a long time. And our next step, folks, is a Presidential Medal of Freedom, if I've got anything to do with it. <laughs> So, um, uh, as we close this part of the conversation out, um, Taylor Branch, you've gone through all the records. You've you know, read through the cases and the, and the conversations. What to you was, a, was the moment in Fred Gray's story that sticks out to you that you want to make sure people remember about the role he played during those years? Well, aside from the bus boycott, it, it, Senator Jones was talking about the lawyer on the street. We are about to have, uh, there, there's rumbles that the prevailing case on libel, the New York Times v. Sullivan case, it may be reviewed now to, and, and change that landmark case. I've interviewed many law students who have no idea that New York Times v. Sullivan grew out of overt racism uh, and blatant um, uh, prejudice uh, on the part of the entire Alabama court system. But that, and, and Attorney Gray was involved in that. He was representing the four Alabama preachers that were dragged into that case and sued, even though they had just signed an ad that said, that, that in the New York Times, that, that said uh, Southern officials were violating the Constitution by arresting people uh, for peaceful protest. And Alabama piled on $3 million worth of libel judgments against it uh, on Fred Gray's clients. People don't know what that meant. Um, it's now a constitutional era case, and students read it and don't even know it had anything to do with race. But for Fred, what it meant was potential bankruptcy for four, for four preachers. Um, and it, it shows how we can forget um, the real the real guts of how race relations are all involved uh, in our constitutional issues. I, you know, I don't think there's any question from a historical point of view that, that race is the best barometer of how we're living up to the American dream or not. All through history, you know, we make progress with it and we fall away. And um, uh, for Fred Gray, I think that I bet most people don't even know he was involved in the New York Times v. Sullivan case, but that's one that's taught in constitutional law today, but not Fred Gray's part. And uh, so I'm proud to have him in there. All right. Uh, and was there one more? Uh, yeah. You know, <laughs> I, 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 you know there are so many things about Fred, and there are so many cases. And when you look at Fred Gray's biography, you're going to see all the cases. You're going to see all the involvement. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing history. But there are so many things about Fred that happened that people don't know, and it's the, the little things. And, you know, I was fortunate in 2001 and 2002 to prosecute two of the, the uh, fellows who bombed the 16th Street Baptist Church. But the first of those cases happened in, 19, in 1977 when a young Alabama attorney general, uh, Bill Baxley, prosecuted a fellow named Robert Chambliss. And Fred was in the legislature at that time. And there was a witness to all of the events, an incredibly important witness who had, was uh, visiting from Detroit in Birmingham on the night of September uh, 14th and 15th in Birmingham. Her name was Gertrude Glenn. 
And she had been out on the town with a friend and they were coming in at two o'clock in the morning and she saw a 1957 Chevrolet parked right there at the church with its dome light on and there were four white men in there and one of whom she later identified. It was at two o'clock in the morning. She identified as Robert Chambliss, Bill's defendant. The car she identified is belonging to Tommy Blanton, someone that I had um, prosecuted. The problem was by the time it got, to, and she told the FBI all of this, but by the time the case got to trial in 1977, Miss Glenn was back in Detroit and she didn't want to come back to Alabama. And I can't blame her. She didn't want to come back to Alabama. And so Baxley sent his investigators up there. They came back and said, she's not coming. She's a great witness. She's got the story. She remembers it. She's not coming. Baxley sent them back up, sent them back down. Good news and bad news. Great witness. But Bill, she's not coming. He gets a, one of his black assistant attorney generals. He, Bill Baxley was the first to hire black assistant attorney generals. He goes up there, talks to Miss Glenn. She serves him tea and cookies. I ain't coming to Alabama. And in those days, you couldn't force her. Baxley finally goes up himself because he thinks he can persuade her. Doesn't happen. She looks at him. She said, Mr. Baxley, not only am I not coming for you, I'm not, if I, when I die, I wouldn't let my body fly over Alabama. <laughs> I'm not coming. And as he's walking out the door, he sees, and this is in 1976, he sees a jet magazine from 1955 about the, it was devoted, the whole, uh, the whole uh, magazine was devoted to the bus boycott. And he picked it up and he's rifling through it and there, lo and behold, there was a picture of Fred Gray with Dr. King and Mrs. Parks. And he looked at Ms. Glenn and he said, now Ms. Glenn, let me ask you something. Because Fred was in the legislature, Bill was attorney general, he said, if, if I can per persuade Mr. Gray to come down and talk to you, the man that Ms. Parks and Dr. King entrusted the civil rights movement to, would you consider coming to Alabama? And she said, well, I'd consider it. And that was a sea change. So he runs out, he gets, the, he gets on the phone, he calls Fred. Fred clears the decks uh, from his law practice in the legislature. He gets on the state plane, he comes to Detroit. When he walks in, and when Fred Gray gets on this stage, you will know he never ages, folks. <laughs> he does not age. And so he walks in the door, and Miss Glenn, who was no shrinking violent, got that jet magazine. And she held it up like this. And she looked at Fred. And she looked at that magazine. She looked at Fred again. She said, it is you. <laughs> and she, she came to Alabama and she was one of Bill's best witnesses. And he convicted Robert Chambliss. And later on, we convicted. So Fred did so much for Bill in that case. <laughs> Well, you guys have done so much for filling in the blanks here on the stage. I appreciate you being here, and uh, we're going to move on to our final act. Thank, Thank you. Thank Our attorney Fred Gray. I can help you. He brought his bag, so he might be about to prosecute a case. <laughs> I'm nervous that I'm supposed to be asking the questions, but... All right. <laughs> um, uh, this, uh, Fred Gray doesn't need very much introduction, but um, I do want to just say here... Fred Gray is a civil rights attorney born in 1930, an activist who practices law in Alabama. He litigated several major civil rights cases um, that ended up before the Supreme Court. 
He also was the, one of the first African Americans elected to the state legislature in Alabama, the president of the National Bar Association. Um, uh, we are, t we spent a lot of time here today talking about your role in things that happened 65 years ago, um, but you've got a lot of work done since that time. So um, let's, let's keep that conversation going. Uh, I want to just ask you a question because you graduated from law school, if I got it right, 1954. What made you go to law school? Uh, it was very simple. I saw a serious problem existing in Montgomery at the time. But Mr. Moderator, before I do that, let me acknowledge the presence of my wife, Carol, who's here with me. Let's do that. <laughs> uh, most, most people don't have, uh, have problems with marriage, and they don't have one good spouse. <laughs> I had the privilege of having had one before for 40 years and I lost her unexpectedly and I met Carol afterwards. She lived up in Cleveland, never been to Alabama before and uh, we met and for, uh, through a mutual friend, friend and uh, I told her I was interested in somebody who wanted to take care of me. <laughs> For the last 20 years, she has done that, and she's still doing it. Thank you very much for coming with us today. Amen. When I was growing up in Montgomery, and I understand you know a little something about Montgomery, or at least little, about Hope Hall. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> but in, in any event, I was... During the 30s and 40s, as I was growing up, there were basically only two professions that African Americans could uh, look forward to that we knew anything about. It was preacher or the teacher. And either one you did, you did it on a segregated basis. But uh, so I decided I, I was going to try to be both. And I went to the Hope Street Church of Christ in Montgomery and uh, as a preacher from Tennessee who knew about a Church of Christ related school up in Nashville. And uh, he said, you need to go to that school. Well, my father died when I was two. But when uh, uh, he somehow she got me up there, I went up, learned a little something about preaching and then came back home in December of 1947 to become a teacher. I uh, attended what was then Alabama State College for Negroes, now Alabama State University. I had to use the transportation system in the city and, I, and it was on a segregated basis and I realized everything in Montgomery was completely segregated. And I decided as an upper teenager, and they told me, I didn't know any lawyers, but they said lawyers help people and they run the service. And I felt that African Americans in Montgomery in the 50s needed lawyers to help. And I made a commitment, most of which was a personal, private commitment. And that commitment was, I was going to finish Alabama State and learn how to become a teacher. But I was going to apply to somebody's law school, not the University of Alabama, because I knew they wouldn't admit me and I didn't want to raise in the sand. I was going to get enrolled in school, take advantage of what Alabama and other states did for African Americans when they were going to graduate school or going to courses which were not offered at Alabama State or Alabama, uh, not offered at University of Alabama or Auburn University, take advantage of some help that the state would give you, uh, finish law school, come back to Alabama, take the Alabama bar exam, 
pass it and destroy everything segregated I could find. <laughs> that was my commitment. And that is what I have been doing in Alabama for over 65 years. So when you were doing that work and you were, and you were fighting these cases, how much, how much discretion did you have in what you, the cases you took? Or did you take the cases that just landed on your desk and went and ran with them? How did you make a decision about what you wanted to participate in and what you didn't? Well, you have to remember, or you would have to know, <laughs> that number one, in 1954, when I became a member of the Alabama Ball, there were only seven African Americans who were already a member of the Ball. And most of them, except for two, had not been a member of the Alabama Ball for five years. So the matter of lawyers was, was, was something new. When I finished the Alabama, uh, when I finished law school, passed the bar exam, no <coughs> law firm, and there was only one black lawyer in town at that time, that was Charles Langford. He'd only been there about a year, and he later became a law partner of mine. The white law firms wouldn't employ me. The state of Alabama as a lawyer wouldn't employ me. So the only thing I could do would be to simply put my shingle out. And you couldn't advertise like lawyers are doing now. <laughs> so you had to be very careful. And the kind of practice that I wanted to do, I had to be extremely careful for it. So the only thing I could do would be to use whatever means I could to let people know that I'm here and I'm a lawyer and I'm ready to do business and I'm here to help you. But say absolutely nothing about my reason for becoming a lawyer was to destroy everything segregated I could find. Because I knew if I did that, they would never have permitted me to pass the bar exam. I don't care how good my paper was or how poor it was. So uh, you're, you're in the middle of all these movements that are taking place. You're there. You're, you're representing. Someone, I, I saw someone ask you the question about, um, well, you said you were in the middle of the civil rights movement, but we never saw you at a march. There was no civil rights movement when I was admitted to practice. So after that? Beg your pardon? After that. Uh, so, so the question I'm asking you is, about the role that you played in the oh. movement uh, versus the role of those who, who were in front of the cameras and in front of the marches? Well, you have to understand, one, that as a lawyer, we're not supposed to go out and solicit clients. You have to use some other means, usually by meeting people and associating with people and going to meetings and hoping somebody would recommend you. And nobody in Montgomery at that time, except for E.D. Nixon and maybe one or two other persons, were doing too much. They were more concerned about getting people registered to vote then they were concerned about destroying segregation because they knew there was a law involved. So a part of my role when I came, as had been while I was a student, because while I was a student at Alabama State before I went to law school, I had already met Mrs. Parks, I already knew Mr. Nixon, he was Mr. Civil Rights in Montgomery, his wife, was a member of the same church I was a member of and used to teach me a little bit in the card class when I was way down the grade. So I had some connection with people who were interested in solving problems. And I connected myself with those persons to see what I could do. And as a result of that, one group of women, the 10 times 1 is 10 club, which was a federated club of black women, educated black women, 
invited me in October of 1954, right after I'd been admitted to the bar, to come and speak for them. And I did. They were celebrating their anniversary. I met these women, many of whom later became connected with the, what developed into the Montgomery bus boycott and what ultimately developed into the beginning of the civil rights movement, according to your historians now. <laughs> but what happened was, I told those women, and they were old enough to be my mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and I told them that as senior members of the community, they had a responsibility to help to destroy desegregation, and they had a responsibility to work toward destroying everything segregated. Well, I tried to get and sell to those ladies what I had already personally been sold on, and that was to destroy everything segregated I could find. And included in those women was Joanne Robinson, Mrs. A.W. West, and some other ladies who later were also members of the Women's Political Council who became quite active and what developed into the Montgomery Bus Boycott. So when you're thinking about the movement from a strategic perspective, there were, you, were focused on, um, you were focused on legal cases. You had ministers and others who were focused on bringing people together in marches. How much as a group did you all talk about the different roles that people had to play to take segregation down, which was your objective? Now, Mr. Moderator, it's hard for me to explain to you how it worked because it didn't quite work like that. Okay. Uh, but there had been, there had been a very serious problem in Montgomery. And while the Montgomery bus boycott developed, I don't think the, the community of Montgomery in 1955 would have done, would have boycotted anything other than the buses. And the reason they wouldn't do it is because almost everybody had a problem on the bus. Mm -hmm. They knew that there were problems. And some of them knew, but most people don't know, is that in 1900, there was a boycott of the, 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 the then streetcars in Montgomery, Alabama, which set a pattern for some people who had checked the history on it. So I think Montgomery was ready for somebody, not necessarily to desegregate the buses, but to do something about solving the problem so that African Americans could be fairly treated and when that opportunity presented itself, and when somebody presented a plan to the people to do it, it took place. Let me ask you about some of the people that you worked with during that moment, particularly Dr. King. Uh, did you have any sense in the beginning that he would rise to the level of prominence that he did in American history? Dr. King didn't come to us. Montgomery for the purpose of starting the Civil Rights Movement. He came to Montgomery for the purpose of being the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, which was an elitist Baptist church, small church, two blocks from the Capitol. Most of the people who attended church there was employed by some governmental agency, and their job depended on them enforcing segregation along with their bosses. Hmm. So you had, there had to be, whatever was going to be done had to be done surreptitiously so that people would be involved in it and yet those persons who had good jobs wouldn't lose them and other people who were willing to take the risk would be willing to do it. And the question was, how can you and what could take place that would enable people to do that? Most people who are living now don't know anything about what, uh, how the Montgomery bus boycott started. 
even the historians who have written the stories, they went and talked to somebody who told them, and, well, and that person who told them may not have told them anything other than what they were told. So there are very few of us left. Mm -hmm. Claudette knows a little something about it. <laughs> because she was my before. first case, <laughs> who on the 2nd of February, 2nd of March of 1955, did what Mrs. Parks did, but she did it nine months before. Without the prodding, without the encouragement, without the knowledge, and without the experience. And if you really, really want to know how it started, you need to get a copy of Bus Ride to Justice. <laughs> and I just happen to brought one. When you get old, you don't know. When, when I want to know what happens to these things. And when I got ready to come to prepare for this presentation, I went back to look at Bus Ride to Justice because when I wrote it initially in the early part of 1990, I verified everything that went in it and the people were living then. You can't do that now. So if you want to know it, it will tell you in the first three chapters of it, the first chapter tells you, it, it talks about the making of a lawyer. The second and the third chapter tells you about the Montgomery bus boycott. You can't know about the work. And then the rest of the chapters develop and tell you about the history and Fred Gray involvement in the Civil Rights Movement and his other activities from the time he was admitted to the bar until 19, what was it, 1913, when this revised edition was done. And I can't tell you all that tonight. <laughs> well, can you give us a flavor, though, or just of... We've talked a lot about what happened at the bus boycott. But again, your career went on after that. And so how did you, did you plot the steps or did you find things that came to you that you thought were important? Tell us just a little bit about your career in the years after uh, 1960. I have told you about the 10 Time Wonders 10 Club. I have mentioned Joanne Robinson. And if there was ever one person who was primarily concerned about and who wanted the community to be get involved in it, it was Joanne Robinson. I didn't want to start a bus boycott. I didn't want to be involved in the boycott other than to tell them what the law is and let them know that the law's outstanding needs to be changed. And I want to be your lawyer to change those roles. So my role, and as you'll notice all of it, you'll see my role has been that of a lawyer, and then these others, and to supplement the others. So shortly after I started practicing, of course I already knew Mrs. Parks, because I had met her, she was chairman of the youth, uh, youth uh, division of the Montgomery branch and secretary of the branch. And she assisted me in setting up my office. She was working at the Montgomery Fair a block and a half from where my office was located. We would have lunch uh, almost every day from the time I opened my office until the day of her arrest and we had lunch on the day of her arrest, and I was out of town when she was arrested. But, so we had talked about the problems during our lunch hours, and when Claudette case came along, she was very interested in that. And of course, Claudette can tell you that her parents knew E.D. Nixon, who knew me, got me involved in her case, I was ready to file a lawsuit on the law for Claudette and her parents, but the community weren't ready. Hmm. I think Claudette was ready, I think her parents were ready. But we found out that there were some other people who were concerned, E.D. Nixon was concerned, and, and Joanne Robinson was concerned, and we began to document things so that 
whenever the next opportunity presents itself, we will be prepared for it. That opportunity presented itself on December 1st, 1955, when Mrs. Parks was arrested. We had had our lunch. I had told her that I was going to have to go out of town that afternoon. And when I got back in town, I found out that Ms. Mrs. Parks had called me and I had a message to call her. I called her and she asked me if, she would, if I would come over to her house and she wanted to talk with me about her case. I went over to her house. She talked with me about her case. She retained me to represent her. She told me what had taken place. This is on Thursday. And uh, her case was set for the following Monday. And I said, well, I'll take care of your case. But I also told us that Ms. Fox, if you remember, Joanne Robbins Robinson, ever since Claudette case, have been publicly talking about we need to do something on the buses. She wants to get, I'm sure, the, the community involved in it. So what I'm going to do when I leave your house, I'm going to go and talk to Mr. Nixon. Uh, he's a Pullman car porter. He's in town three days a week. He's out of town three days a week. And let him know that you have retained me. He had already signed her bond to get her out. I left uh, his, her house, went to Mr. Nixon's house on Clinton Avenue, told him she had retained me. And I said, Mr. Nixon, you know, Joanne Robinson had talked about getting the community involved. And if we're going to get the community involved, now is the time to do it. He said, well, I've got to go out of town, but when you get through talking to Ms. Robinson, you let me know, and I'm, I feel that I'd be able to support it, and we'll see what we can do so that we'll get the community involved by the time Ms. Park's uh, case is on Monday. I left his house and went to Joanne Robinson's house. She lived on the other side of town on Carey Street near Alabama State. I talked with her on the phone first. I came by, talked with her, and we sat down in her living room, and the two of us, and only the two of us, sat in that living room on the evening of December the 1st and December, the morning of December 2nd, and made the plans for the Montgomery Bus Boycott. Basically, we concluded, one, if we're going to get involved in a case or do anything, now is the time to do it. Two, if we're going to do it, we need to have, uh, she wanted to get the community involved. I say, if you're going to try to get people off of the bus between now and Monday, and this is now Friday morning, we've got to get something done. We can't tell people, I say, it's going to take longer than a few days to get a lawsuit done. So it's going to take some time for the lawsuit. But we're going to have to be prepared if they stay off of the buses to be able to keep them off until they can go on a non-segregated basis. We concluded if we're going to do that, there are a couple of things we're going to need. One, we're going to need a spokesman. Two, we're going to need to somehow get some information out. Three, some money somebody's going to have to raise to help get away where people can go. As a result of our discussions, make a long story short, this is the conclusions we reach. One, now is the time to do it. Two, Joanne suggested the person who needs to be appointed as the spokesman is my pastor, Dr. Martin Luther King, because one, he hasn't been involved in civil rights activities, but one thing he can do is move people with move, move words. I said, that's fine. I admit him. But if you think he's a person, I'll go along with it. I said, there are, other, endorsement. The other thing, though, there are two other black leaders here that you've got to have their support if you're going to get people off of the bus. One is going to be E.D. Nixon. He had the largest following. And then there's Rufus Lewis. E.D. Nixon was also president of the, of, of the Montgomery Progressive Democratic Group. And I said... He's a poor man, Carpoto. We need to make him the treasurer. He knows A. Philip Randolph, the labor leader in New York, who's president of his union. He'll help to raise some money. Then your other, little, other leader was Rufus Lewis. 
Rufus Lewis on the nightclub. Well, what can you do with a nightclub? <laughs> well, in order to do anything, you had to be a registered voter. However, his wife, Jewel, was the co-owner of the largest funeral home in town. They have automobiles and they have drivers. They can help transport them. Make him chairman of the transportation committee. Well, there's going to be some legal work that needs to be done. Here am I, send me. When we left her home and when I left her house, the decision was we're going to have to get the message out so that whenever the official meeting takes place, uh, Reverend King will be the chair, Rufus Lewis will be the treasurer, uh, uh, Rufus Lewis will be the chairman of the Transportation Committee, E.D. Nixon will be the treasurer, and Fred Gray will be the lawyer. <laughs> and when that official meeting took place after the boycott started that morning at Mount Zion Church, those things took place and the bus boycott continued and the mass meeting occurred. Dr. King spoke. I prepared two resolutions, one if it had been successful and one if it had not. We set out in that resolution exactly what our proposals would be and that was the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott and you can read all about it in Bus Ride to Justice. <laughs> Let me, let me ask you one more question before we, before we go. Um, we started out talking about this moment of being, uh, it's being a moment of movements again in America. Do you, what lessons would you impart to this generation's activists from your generation of activism? Uh, we, the new generation, has the same problems that their foreparents had. The problem that started to begin with was racism and inequality. It started with slavery. And ever since that time, African Americans and other people who have been interested in it have been trying to work on it. That's what we was doing in the Montgomery Bus Boycott. That's what the NAACP had been doing and other groups had been doing since uh, Negroes arose here. So basically, we had then, we had to confront the laws. We had to get the laws declared unconstitutional because they were segregating you then based on race because the law said it. So we had the responsibility of getting those laws destroyed and that is what I have done for the last 65 years in almost any aspect of American life. If you think about it, I've had a little something to do with it, with a lot of help along the way, along with the divine help. So I said to those people that you need to look at your community, see what the problems are, discuss it with other people. Don't go out there and try to do it by yourself. Try to get them to work with you, and then do whatever it takes and orders to solve the problems of racism and inequality, which we still now have. All right. In the mouth of a giant. Uh, I want to thank you, but is there anything uh, that you would like to... Is there anything you'd like to leave with us uh, before we... Before well, we good night? I need to leave a little closing statement with yes, you. Yes, please. please. And I think it. I'll stand up and do it if you let me. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to first thank uh, the president and founder of this organization for inviting me to become a part of it. I've already thanked Carol for being here. I want to particularly thank Claudette. Claudette has made a real sacrifice. When I heard she was coming, I couldn't believe it. I think the last thing I might have seen her was when she was leaving the Bronx and they were giving her a send-off party and I went up to participate in it. So for her to come, I want to thank her and thank her sister Gloria who takes care of her. I want to thank these other persons who participated in this activity here. And as I look back over 66 years of law practice, I 
want to share a few things with you. I never thought when I started to practice law that I would be invited by this organization to come here and to be online and to be doing whatever you're going to do with this film. And I don't know what you're going to do with it, <laughs> but I hope it's something good. I never thought that I would be honored by receiving honorary degrees at various institutions and a marker in front of the Supreme Court building on Dexter Avenue in Montgomery, Alabama, a piece of property that I used to own that talks about the marker that I have made there. But uh, as a teenager, as I have indicated to you earlier, I saw problems that needed to exist in Montgomery and decided to try to do something about it. And with a lot of help along the way, during my career, we have been able, with a lot of help, to file lawsuits to end segregation and transportation, to help with voter registration, to protect members of nonprofit organizations such as the NAACP so that it could do business in the state, the right to have public education without discrimination, equal access to farm subsidies, health care, as I set forth in the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, the right to serve on juries, and in many others. And just on September the 1st, I filed a lawsuit in Tuskegee, Alabama, so that Macon County can get back the land in where the old courthouse used to be which now has on it and has had on it for over 50 years a statue of a Confederate soldier. That may be the last civil rights suit I'll file. But the problems that we've had during all these periods of time has not changed. The history of the civil rights movement needs to be preserved. We have a whole generation of young people who don't know anything about hardcore segregation. They know nothing at all about what their parents had to undertake. So then, we need to have organizations like the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center. And I want to thank this organization for inviting me up to speak and agreeing to contribute a contribution to it. But these non-profit groups, including that one. And the one that we have in Tuskegee is just one of many, but it needs your help. What we do in it is three basic things. One, we educate, we educate the public on all of these things. One is for the purpose of showing the contribution made by Native Americans, we used to call them Indians, Americans of Europeans, we used to call them whites, and Americans, African Americans, Negroes, or Blacks. If you can see in one roof the contribution made by each and the improvements we have made, it means that whatever problems we have not, not nearly as bad as what we have had, and we need to complete it. That's one mission. The second mission I represented the men in the infamous Tuskegee Syphilis Study. While I was filing the lawsuits against agents of the state of Alabama, I found the federal government was engaged in a deadly deception against African Americans, and it was racially inspired, and it was financed by the government. When I filed their lawsuit and got as much money as we could get, and when I was able to get an apology from them, they announced the formation of the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center, also known as the Tuskegee History Center. And when we were able to get the president to make an apology, Mr. Shaw, who introduced the president, says, we want you to help with that uh, organization that he has now just formed. And the president got up and said, Mr. Shaw, we're going to help you. Well, what they, what he didn't realize then, the president, is that Tuskegee Institute wanted some money for a bioethics center. And they got that bioethics center 
and they got it from the federal government and still get it. We were able, notwithstanding that, to still farm this. And those men say, what we want is a, a, a museum so that the government and everybody will know that we made a contribution. So the second thing is to do that. And then the third thing is, it gives you a history of the Civil Rights Movement from the time that African Americans were brought to this country until the present time. And you'll be able to see all of the laws, you'll be able to see all of the cases, and you'll see five of the precedent-setting cases filed by African Americans from Macon County, Alabama, that now has helped all of us. And that is why I'm here, so that you can help the Tuskegee Human and Civil Rights Multicultural Center do what needs to be done. And also help that 501c31 in your community. So then, the struggle continues. Where are we today? As we sit here today and talk about racism, I want you to know that racism and inequality, those are the two problems we had when we came here, and we still have those problems today. We must continue to fight for doing a with them. I want to leave you with this challenge. If what I have said to you and what others have said to you as you have engaged in your activities this year and over the years since your existence, and what I have done during my legal career for the last 66 years, if it means anything, unfortunately it means that in this country we still have two major problems. Those problems are racism and two, inequality. If the life and work of Dr. King, Mrs. Parks, Congressman Lewis means anything, it means that the struggle continues for equal justice under the law, particularly for minorities and for women. More importantly, it also means we must continue to work for equality and must continue to work toward ending racism. It means that there is a real challenge as to whether the gains we have obtained will continue or whether we will lose them. If we lose, it means that Dr. King and all the others who have given their lives for the protection of human and civil rights will have died in vain. If we lose, the nation loses. The struggle has not ended. Racial discrimination in this country has not ended. We do not have a level playing field. There is no such thing as racial neutrality in America. The consequences of over 400 years of slavery, segregation, inequality, and discrimination has not ended with the march on Washington and Dr. King's I Have a Dream. Unfortunately, we still have those problems. And the National Urban League says that the disparity between African Americans and whites in the areas of economics, health, education, social justice, and civil engagement, each one has a substantial disparative effect among African Americans. So then I say to you that just as those disparities exist in the past, the question before us as we stand here today and deal with your theme, where do we go from here? The question then is, as you sit at this program, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to sit here and go away and forget it? Or where do we go from here? I want to suggest to you four things. And four things, four ways of doing away with racism and inequality. First of all, we have to recognize that it's a problem. See, some people think, since you can sit where you want on, on, the, on the bus, 
but you can't hardly get a job to pay the fare. But we have to recognize that it's racism and inequality is wrong. It needs to start at the White House. It needs to also begin in the Congress and the Supreme Court. It needs to be at the heads of our CEOs. It needs to be at the heads of our educational institution. They need to say that racism and inequality is wrong. And if it starts there, then the people down below will be okay. Secondly, once you acknowledge you have a problem, you have to come up with a plan. If Joanne Robinson and I had not sat in her living room on the evening of December 1st and December 2nd and made some detailed plans that we didn't want people to know we did because she would have lost her job earlier and I would have been disbarred and they tried to do it several times. So then, you have to come up with a plan. We made the plan. We gave it to people. And people who got in the official meetings and made the motions didn't even know where it came from. And we didn't want to know where it came from. We wanted it to be done. So you got to come up with a plan. The second thing you got to do, a plan is no good unless you do what? Implement it. So you've got to implement the plan. You come up with your plan. Joanne and I, she left and went and, 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 and rent off 50,000 leaflets. I went and got legal help to help us with all the legal work. And we set in motion those things. Once you get a plan and once you begin to implement it, there's one other thing. You can't depend on somebody else to do it. Each one of us are going to have to do it. So I say to you, as I close, and I say to all persons interested in civil rights, and I want to just mention one other thing before I do that. I want to leave you, both young and old, with a message that Congressman John Lewis, the great civil rights nonviolence warrior, told me a few days before his death when he had uh, uh, only, the, when we had our last conversation on July the 8th, 2020, I asked the congressman, considering your great civil rights record, what is it you want me to do? He told me over the phone, said, brother, keep pushing. Keep going, set the record straight. So I said to all of you, all persons interested in civil rights, keep pushing, keep going, set the record straight, so that, and do that in a non-violent manner, and continue to do so until justice rolled down that water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Thank you very much. Oh, oh. it's the mail. It's not mine. <laughs> wants to take a photo.
right, thank you, thank you everybody for being here and a very special thanks to Mr. Gray for making the trip here. We're honored beyond words. I know that we're all very, very moved by his words and we're grateful that you were here. Thank you also to Mr. Simmons, Mr. Branch and uh, Senator Jones. Thank you all. We'd also like to acknowledge that Ms. Colvin's family is here tonight. If you would take a stand so we can acknowledge you. Thank you so much. And we'd also like to thank all of the people who make the March on Washington Film Festival possible. Uh, it's impossible to name you all, but we see you, we acknowledge you, we honor you, and we're very grateful for all that you do. I'd also like to say that the festival continues this weekend. Films are available to stream online on our site, marchonwashingtonfilmfestival.org. And please join us on Monday at 7 a.m. live here in Washington, D.C. at the Eaton Hotel, or stream us online for the importance of Polly Murray, uh, an engaging multi-arts program in tribute to the groundbreaking civil rights activist. Thank you all so much, and good night.